1972, Hong Kong is still British colony. At the opening of Hong Kong's first underwater tunnel, called Victoria Harbor, linking the island to the mainland, two local billionaires playboys philanthropists give a speech. One of them is also a genius, and it is specifically this man, whose name is Paul Wagner. He was the one who personally designed and oversaw the construction of the tunnel. After the official opening and celebratory ceremony, Mr. Wagner with his wife, nanny, and two sons is on the way to his mansion, radioing his faithful assistant in all matters, including the power ones, who follows them in his own car in order to tell him that he can go home for tonight. We'll be fine. You take the night off. Frank tells his boss that he left them a gift in the glove compartment, a cigar box with Paul Wagner's initials and a handmade lighter. Just as Frank heads home on his way, an unknown vehicle gets on Wagner's tail. Frank, I did say you could take the night off. I heard you loud and clear. Then that's not your car following us. Oh. No. Frank quickly turns around and heads towards the Wagner mansion. Outside the mansion, Asian strangers with malevolent facial expressions are already waiting for them. Bolo, the big guy, starts firing a shotgun at the car. A shootout ensues, during which Paul Wagner is killed. His business partner, accompanied by some Chinese man, watches the shootout from the distance. Paul's wife is also brutally shot by Bolo Young. Just as he is about to kill the babies, Frank comes up and kills a good dozen of scoundrels with accurate shots, including the brutal big man. He tells Nanny to take the children and get away, which she does. However, from the infant screaming from the car, he realizes that the Nanny was only able to carry off one twin. The big man stands up again, only to catch another of Frank's bullets with his cheek. The man grabs the remaining infant and goes away. Bolo, like some sort of Terminator, rises again and wounds Frank in the shoulder. Running away, Frank spots Paul's partner and realizes who organized this ambush. Griffith. In the morning, the nanny drops the baby off at a Catholic orphanage. Frank and the second baby are smuggled out of Hong Kong. 25 years later, one of the babies named Chad, whom Frank raised as his own son from the age of six months, enjoys working at Frank's fitness center in a stretching group. The boy has grown up quite spoiled by female attention, likes to flirt, and show off in front of ladies. A detective comes to Frank, and he asks Chad to replace him in the karate group. Take over the karate class. Like this? One of the problematic students decided to troll Chad for his very unusual outfit that doesn't fit in the karate class. During the conflict, Chad calms the troublemaker down with a sedative Ura Mawashi. Meanwhile, in the office, the detective shows Frank a photo of Chad's twin, Alex. That second twin turns out to be a very famous man in the criminal world of Hong Kong. Without going into any details, Frank tells Chad that they need to go to Hong Kong for some important business. Uncle Frank, uh, I'm not your uncle. You're not my uncle. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, after 25 years, you're telling me you're not my uncle. At first, Chad is not too eager to leave his comfortable spot among beautiful slim ladies, but Frank manages to convince him. Upon their arrival to Hong Kong, Chad is amazed by the city's rich infrastructure and intends to explore it in detail. However, Frank says they need to stop by one joint first. Wearing pink pant shorts, Chad, accompanied by Frank, walks into a mahjong bar. What is this? It's a mahjong parlor. The bartender calls him chief and pours him a drink. Afterward, same bartender assesses Chad's slightly gay outfit with a dismissive gesture. A wild Asian man slides into the bar and hands Chad a wad of Hong Kong bucks. A leggy blonde enters the room and begins openly flirting with Chad, who is completely clueless what is going on by this time. She admits to being flabbergasted by his outfit and beckons the guy. Frank gives him sound advice. Go on. Go see what she wants. I think she wants to talk to you. Finally, being just on their own in the back room, the girl bossily starts unzips his shorts. She is surprised to see him wearing silk underpants. Silk underwear. But they are interrupted by Alex, who knocks Chad out in a cocky manner, just with a headbutt. <laughs> Coming back to his senses, Chad hears jealous Alex attacking his girlfriend for touching another man. Look at it, fuck it. He looks exactly like you. 
Look like me? You of all people should know I would never in my life wear black silk underwear. Frank clears up the situation by informing the men that they are twins, fatefully separated for 25 years. Cocky Alex d***s around aggressively talking to the uninvited guests. You've got both of you 10 seconds to get the f*** out. And refuses to believe that the wimp is his brother. But Frank eventually manages to convince Alex to just listen to him. He tells them that their father was building a tunnel, but in the middle of the project, he had financial difficulties, and he had to take Griffith as a partner. In his turn, Griffith secretly borrowed a large sum of money from the Chen criminal family. When the tunnel was completed, they decided to get rid of the idea leader of the project and ordered his murder. They wanted to kill the babies too, so that the whole empire would be passed on only to Chen and Griffith. But the true heirs of the company, which by the way is the richest in Hong Kong, survived. And now these two can claim their rights. Alex doesn't want to get involved because he doesn't believe that anything can be changed. But Chad is up for anything except hunger strike and is ready to try his luck. So that the two men don't get lost in the unfamiliar underworld of Hong Kong, Alex condescendingly agrees to help them settle into the city. While Alex is transporting his guests to the island by boat, Frank notices his AK-47. What's a piece for? Just in case. Case of what? A boat with local speculators approaches them. Alex sells them two brand new Ferraris to be shipped to communist China. The trunks of both cars are stuffed to the top with all kinds of goods scarce for China, cartons of Marlboro, and cases of cognac. Ah. After receiving a briefcase full of bucks, the businessmen notice police boats. The buyers think Alex set them up and want to get their money back. You set us up. No Mercedes, no cash. However, Alex and Frank manage first to scatter the Asians without returning the money and handing over the cars. Then they get away from the police pursuit by dropping new Ferraris into the water and setting them on fire with an AK-47 shot. Apparently, they had some strong, highly flammable cognac in those trunks. After the incident, over the lunch, Frank asks Alex what he plans to do next with their tunnel. Now what do we do about your tunnel? My tunnel. And if he has made up his mind about joining them. Danielle asks Frank a classic question. Is there any sort of proof? A legal proof of unlawful expropriation of their company is needed. The girl doesn't believe the man and the whole story about killing her boyfriend's parents. Frank aggressively tells that he personally is a first-hand witness and saw the twins' parents being shot. The girl cannot stand the old man's tone and leaves. This leaves Frank confused. Jeez, what's her problem? Alex admits that Danielle works for Griffith, and she has always thought he was a decent businessman. Chad worries that she may now reveal everything to her employer. Oh, great. She's going to tell him everything. Alex catches Catches up with Danielle and asks her to check the company archives to see if she can find any information about their father. The girl reluctantly agrees. Chad arrives at Alex's bar, where he is taken by some gangsters, confusing him with his brother. Ooh. Sun the jacket. They point a revolver at him and demand to get into the boss's car. The door is opened for him by that very big man named Bolo with a scar on his cheek. None other than Chen, who loaned Griffith the money to build the tunnel, is waiting for Chad in the car. Chad is excited by such an unexpected encounter. Chen suggests that instead of smuggling alcohol, he should take up drug trafficking. Of course, he doesn't realize that it is not Alex either. Then he pulls out a cigar box with Chad's father's initials on it, which takes Chad's breath away. Chen brings the guy to the docks and tries to get him to cooperate. He tells him where and when is the next drug shipment that he has to ship by using his connections, kind of leaving the guy without a chance to refuse this offer. On Thursday... I'm afraid that we were waiting to deliver some cargo in Tolo Harbor. After Chen throws away Chad's father's non-functioning lighter, Chad finally tells the Chinese in a shaky voice that he is a bastard. I didn't hear you. You go f*** yourself. Big mistake. For such a behavior, Bolo punches him in the solar plexus and orders his men to give him a good beating. However, Chad successfully fights back and stands his ground. For a failed attempt in beating Chad, Bolo snaps neck of one of his men. He then beats Chad to a pulp with his own hands. Chen says goodbye to Chad. You get any more of the French cognac? You know where to find me. Chad is then thrown unconscious into the street outside Alex's bar. Chad tells Frank about the situation. How many were there? At least eight. I could have taken them. <laughs> of course. Of course. Except that 
Big Chinese ugly motherfucker. Of course. Chad describes the big guy who beat him up to Frank, and he immediately realizes who Chad is talking about. With a big scar on his cheek. After this situation, the brothers are finally ready to do anything to see justice done. Meanwhile, Danielle is digging through the archives in an attempt to find any clue. However, she is interrupted by a pushy security officer, who asks her uncomfortable questions, forcing Danielle to quickly leave the room. The girl calls Alex and says that there is something suspicious going on because she is being watched every time she enters the archive. Alex asks her to try her luck one more time. When being asked where he is going now, Alex laughs off. Where are you, by the way? I'm taking my brother on a uh, fishing trip. Give him a big kiss for me, all right? Big kiss? I'll give him a big kick in the ass. That's what I'll give him. I love you. In fact, he brings Frank and Chad to a secluded island with an abandoned hotel. This place will now become their headquarters. Alex provides them with an arsenal of all calibers. In the evening, they head to the address that Chen gave to Chad in order to foil his deal. They silently eliminate several guards and set up explosives. Alex tells Chad to cover him as he makes his way to the ship. And lastly, he says a phrase that would make anyone's stress level go through the roof in any situation. Don't f*** up. While Alex is setting up the plastic explosives inside the ship, an agitated Chad, in an attempt to silently take down one guard who is heading towards Alex, creates unnecessary noise, which attracts Chen's heavily armed men. A hot shootout ensues, from which the brothers manage to escape without a single wound. In the end, they blow up the docks with all of Chen's goods. Alex says that Chad actually f***ed up due to his inability to move stealthily. When meeting with Alex, Danielle says she could be fired for taking too much interest in archival records, and again expresses her attitude to Griffith. He's as honest and legitimate a businessman as I've ever met. After a hot kiss, the girl informs Alex that Griffith has scheduled an urgent meeting at Chen's club today. In the evening, Griffith celebrates the acquisition of a new ocean liner with his partners. He also informs those present that there was an unpleasant incident last night that caused them to lose a large shipment of goods. He suspects one of his counterparties and his security guards immediately carry out the sentence. What a f***ing great idea to kill your partners when your main partner is blabbing everywhere about the location and timing of upcoming deals. On Thursday, Thursday, Thursday afraid we were waiting to deliver some cargo in Tolo Harbor. Alex brings a crate of explosives into a restaurant under the guise of cognac that is loved by Chen. Hey, Alex! Didn't think we'd be seeing you around here so soon. Those scars healed pretty good, didn't they? The security guard successfully brings this crate to the boss. What's that? French cognac, sir. From our friend Alex. And then it dawns on Chen that they may have just killed the wrong person. He knew about last night's shipment. Invite him in here. A sleek Chad disguised as Alex bring in a second crate of explosives from the back door. Frank, with a radio detonator, waits for his turn in the hall with some escort girl, who actually tells him the truth, by the way. You are a very handsome man, like Sean Connery. Uh -huh. I mean, he really looks like Sean Connery. The guard approaches Chad and demands he follow him to the boss. Frank signals him, and Chad falls on the floor. <laughs> An explosion blasts, but no one is hurt. A pretentious brawl begins with blackjack and spinning hook kicks. Chen and Griffith see that Alex has a twin, and they realize who the guys really are. There's two of them. The brothers and Frank successfully escape on their feet. The next day, Danielle finally digs up the documents she needs. A pushy security officer walks in and searches the girl in a pretty biased and intimate manner. And if I don't find anything, I can let you go. All of this is bugged by Griffith and Chen. When she is done, the athlete girl suggests that Danielle now searches her. And now you can frisk me. Danielle calls Alex, but Chad picks up the phone as his brother and Frank have gone into the woods to get some firewood. The girl says she found the right documents, but she is being followed. Chad asks her to urgently go to Alex's bar, where he will meet her. It turns out the whole conversation is being bugged by the villains, not finding Frank and Alex. Alex! Yo, Frankie! Chad takes a boat and goes to Alex's bar. Chad! Frank and Alex return from the woods and cannot figure out where Chad went on the only boat they had. 
Meanwhile, Chad meets Danielle at a bar. She shows him the paperwork, and now they have proof. Frank was right about everything. At this moment, a jealous Alex calls his assistant at the bar, who tells him that Danielle is in his office with his brother. That is when Griffith's crew rolls up to the bar. They break in and put the phone down. Alex freaks out in jealousy and smashes the iPhone 15 with his fist. The bartender assistant manages to signal Chad, and they make their way out of the building through a secret passage. A chase across the whole town ensues. During the chase, Chad and Danielle manage to escape in their boat. However, the athlete security girl jumps on a helicopter and tracks down the boat, which leads safely to their secret headquarters. Let's go back. Meanwhile, Alex is already shit-faced from his jealousy and from all the alcohol he drank. He also fantasized about his brother test driving his girlfriend. Upon arrival, Chad and Danielle run into a drunk Alex, who happily smacks both of them. A brutal showdown between the brothers ensues, which nearly drives Alex to liken himself to Kane. In an attempt to separate the two Van Dams, Frank gets punched in the face. However, an argument in the forms of a couple of shots from the AK-47 cools down the brothers. You're drunk. Maybe I'm drunk. Tomorrow I'll be sober, but he'll always be a f it. Alex goes for a walk on the island. In the morning, having sobered up, Alex sees a whole Griffith's army dropping off at the island. Making his way through the jungle to the building where Frank and Danielle are, Alex successfully kills a lot of mercenaries, not forgetting to show off his biceps. Such a poser. However, by storming the building, Chen's men managed to take Frank and Danielle captives and take them away by helicopter. Only a handful of mercenaries are left to finish off the brothers. But it is not that easy to kill the brothers. Such a poser. So they brilliantly get rid of the remaining mercenaries, and one is taken hostage as an informant. They find out where their loved ones have been taken, and it unites the brothers again, and they sneak on to Griffith's liner, where he holds the hostages. Where's your brother? <laughs> Meanwhile, Griffith and Chen torture Frank with a vape machine to get him to tell them where they have taken the documents. But Frank, being a Vietnam veteran, doesn't give up neither under the hot steam nor the rhythmic punches to his ribs. The brothers are killing the mercenaries at full strength as they make their way to the bosses. They take down dozens of Griffith's men, and each gets to their own mini-boss. Alex goes one-on-one -on -one with some taekwondo fighter who has spurs on his boots, and he perfectly mauls his enemies with them. After a few missed kicks with those spurs, Alex eventually kills his first boss. Meanwhile, Chad is attacked by a barrel-throwing Donkey Kong. Chad is literally surviving in the fight with this big guy, who surpasses him in all aspects. However, when the big guy once again snatches a barrel with excellent weightlifting technique by the way, Chad manages to jump over him and knocks Bolo out by taking advantage of his disorientation. The fuel spilled from the barrels ignites, and the explosive chain reaction occurs. The two gang bosses are escaping off the ship. Alex goes down to the hookah lounge and engages in a battle with his second boss, an athlete girl. After a long and hot fight, he barely kills the girl by stabbing her own knife into her liver. He asks his brother to take care of Frank and his girlfriend, to which Chad happily agrees. Danielle is also glad that Alex has finally learned to trust his brother. The young and athletic Alex, with great difficulty, after a long chase, manages to catch up with the already mature Chen, who has never lifted anything heavier than a glass of cognac during his whole life. However, the man provides some serious resistance to Alex in the fight. Having defeated his main boss, Alex is ready to finish him off, but Chen generously offers him half of everything. I'll give you half of everything. I mean, you get it, right? The cunning Chinese man offers Alex half of Alex's inheritance so that Alex let him live. Alex doesn't buy it, however, and throws Chen off a crane. Meanwhile, Chad and Danielle are trapped. Griffith on a loader tries to crush him with a container. Chad saves Danielle by pushing her between the containers and jumps into the water himself. Griffith gets out and fires at the water. In the meantime, Chad gets out of the water from the other side and climbs into the loader booth. He drops a 20-foot container on him. Such a poser. The wounded brothers finally hug each other, and everyone is happy that they managed to kill half of Hong Kong so that justice could be served. 
Well, that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed it and liked it. And I guess the comment section is full of comments about Ferraris and AK-47.